Hey everyone, I'm Sarah LaVon and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am back for more of your questions from the comments on previous YouTube videos and then from Instagram. And today I am going to get into questions about precipitous delivery or fast labors. That one has been like super popular in the last month or so. We're gonna talk about burping your baby. We're gonna talk about what you can do to prep yourself for better milk for breastfeeding. We're gonna talk about positions for labor for a faster labor. We're gonna talk about your pelvis being too small and needing a C-section. We're gonna talk about, I can't remember all the other things. We talked about so many of your questions today, but I will link everything in the description box down below for you to check out. But before I get started, don't forget to subscribe down below, give it a like, share it with a friend, and then let's get started. We are gonna start off this coffee and questions going to YouTube and the comments on YouTube. It is always so fun for me to get to scroll through and see all of your sweet comments. But I wanna answer some questions from YouTube. So this comes from Courtney Busby on my last coffee and questions that is titled Kardashian style birth. She says, can you please do a video on fast labors? I'm currently pregnant with baby number three and my first baby was six hours from the first contraction to delivery. And my second was only an hour and 40 minutes from the first contraction to delivery. Is it always the case that labor gets quicker the more babies you have? Okay, so I see this as a two part question. The first question is, does it always get quicker the more babies you have? This is where guys, flex and flow. If I say flex and flow, I mean it even more for this kind of stuff. I am going to try to give you an overview of the norm, but the norm for labor and birth is so loose and so not concrete. And so just kind of like whatever goes, that's why I say flex and flow. So in general, the answer is the first baby typically takes the longest. Second baby typically goes pretty fast compared to the first, especially. Third baby we say is like the wild card. It could go slower, it could go faster than the second. And then the more babies you have though, in general, yes, the easier it is. And that's because there's less resistance down there. It's like your first baby paved the way. I always say like your, your first baby sort of like you're hazing into parenthood because it always, loosely always takes longer. Now, with that being said, I also put out a poll on Instagram and you, the number of you that asked about fast labors, I've seen it on your comments, this probably deserves its own video, but I figured I would tackle it here. Fast labor by definition, and fast is technically in the eye of the beholder, but is where your, your painful contractions start to delivery is about is three hours or less. That's considered a precipitous birth. It has a terminology, it has a name. There actually is a little bit of risk involved with the precipitous birth. It is typically uncommon, and so if you've watched any of my videos, my when to go to the hospital, my sure signs of labor, what happens when your water breaks, laboring at home, tips for laboring at home, uh, probably some other ones you're gonna, if you've taken my childbirth class for sure, you're gonna learn, especially for a first labor, that the sort of like the best strategy is to be in denial and slow everything down and understand that labor takes time and time is not bad. The average first time mom is somewhere around 24 hours of labor plus. People tell me like, oh my God, I had a 36 hour laboring. While 36 hours is a very long time, I validate that entirely. 36 hours is not uncommon for a first time parent, okay? Even beyond, I've done three, four, five day labors. And mind you, that's miserable. God bless you all if you have a five day labor, but it does happen and it's not necessarily concerning so long as there isn't other medical concerns happening. So a precipitous birth, to go from like 36 hours to three hours, you can imagine from no sensation or just like pregnancy sensations to like bam, baby out and pushing, that is a ton of stress on your body. It is completely overwhelming for a lot of people. It's harder to cope because you're not like working into contractions. It does happen and that's where the flex and flow of labor comes in and why I say as one of my second rules, I think it's in my like intro video, I talk about how always your instinct, your sensations are everything, okay? Now for this Courtney, who talks about how she had a six hour labor and then an hour and 40 minutes. You can imagine you're like, if that was an hour and 40 minutes and they keep getting faster, like how fast can we go here? <laughs> okay, and that's where flex and flow, trust your sensations. And could the third one take about the same as the second? Yes, okay, I've, I, I don't know, and again, like, all of my births start kind of blurring together, but in general, I expect a third, fourth, fifth, 
I would say up to five to go kind of like the second, but there are so many different factors contributing to the length of labor. When they talk about precipitous birth, really they think it's a combination of less resistance in the pelvis. So the pelvis, the pelvic floor, your ligaments, that there's not a ton of tension in there. It's just kind of like, open, not that you're literally, but inside, it's like everything's really soft and there isn't much resistance. Or you have abnormally strong contractions where your contractions are doing even more work because one of the issues with labor or one thing that can slow down labor is the strength of contractions. We need a certain amount of strength to really push baby. You imagine if I'm pushing something small, something big through a small hole, you need to like push it through. If I'm like, meh, come on, baby, just like this, that's not gonna do anything, right? We need like uh, contractions. And if you have really strong contractions, that could contribute. Also, they think that it could be something like that your sensations of the pain maybe aren't, you aren't aware or you have less or less sensation or more pain tolerance. So it's almost like there's a lot going on, but you're just unaware of it. So this is where I want you to take a deep breath. I want you to think about your sensations. Some signs to go would be if, you're, if your labor comes on and you are zero to a hundred, like where it's like, ooh, ow, oh, oh, ha, and like immediately you're in the throes of labor and you're feeling rectal pressure, you're feeling like pushing. If all of a sudden they're just like abnormally, especially if you've been through labor before, but like where you're like, this is not like an easy work into it, or like a work into labor. It's like wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. We are at it, we are on it, we are strong and we are regular from the beginning. It could be going faster, but my fear is that by telling you, or like especially stuff you see on TV or people delivering in the car or something, those are never first time moms, although I do know of a couple that it's happened to, so it does happen. But in general, those are mostly moms that have had babies before and things just went fast. So trust your instinct. If you feel pushy, get in the car and could it go faster? Yeah. And I will say that as much as like we don't encourage elective inductions, that for some, if that was traumatic for you, so I have seen patients and clients elect for an induction at 39 weeks rather than the fear of it being so fast at home. So flex and flow, trust your instincts. And if you want to le learn more about it, it's called precipitous birth, precipitous delivery. Let me know if you want an entire dedicated video on it, but that's what I got for now. <laughs> this is a good one. Okay. This is like hitting my pain points. <laughs> okay. Marilyn Lopez. This comes from my back labor video. If you haven't seen this one, this one like has been highly requested and a huge concern for patients. And a lot of times I hear my clients are told your baby's like sunny side up or it's facing the wrong way, et cetera. So I have a whole couple, I have three videos on that. So make sure you check them out. This, so Marilyn Lopez says, so my son was sunny side up and was taking too long to descend and he was having D cells. So we had an urgent C-section. D cells are just the heart rate was dropping. I was told that I, ha I had a way too small of a birth canal and I should never deliver naturally or vaginally. Is this really possible? Your video has me questioning what to do when it comes to my next pregnancy. So sorry to uh, make you confused. Mind you, that's sort of why I'm here is to empower you with options and choices and, and ideas and thoughts and empowerment to go talk to your provider. Okay. So this whole small birth canal thing, I have a couple of videos. I know I've talked about it before, but especially related to OP position. And especially because I, I currently have a client that we've been going back and forth about her doctor telling her her baby's really big. It gets in y'all's heads, okay? The only way to know if your baby fits through your pelvis is by trying, okay? Ultrasounds are not perfect. Even a provider going inside and saying like, oh, you have a small pelvis, that's not a perfect science, okay? No one can tell you your baby doesn't fit until you try. There are so many factors that go into this baby fitting through your pelvis, okay? Size of baby, position of baby. Your baby may have been OP last time, and who's to say if it was OA or the right side up, meaning face down, that this time around that the baby may just slip inside out. Maybe baby is significantly smaller than last time. Maybe there's less, less tension in your pelvic floor. Maybe you feel more supported and your psyche is more at ease. There are so many contributing factors the only way to know is by trying. And so mind you, of course, I'm never going to say to go against your doctor's recommendation, but I want us questioning this stuff. If your dream and your desire and your goal is to have a vaginal birth, 
The only way to know is by trying. And while trying, especially in helping the baby navigate the pelvis, this is one of my huge passions of my life, why I have an entire eight hour workshop where I train nurses on this, is that those position changes, understanding what's happening in the body and moving your body in a way to help the baby be turned in the right way and not have all those malpositions. They do a lot of this because even that way you still can deliver vaginally a lot of times. Um, is so important. And who's to say this next time that you, something is different in there and, and the baby does fit, or maybe there aren't D cells where the heart rate's dropping. If the heart rate's not dropping, you in theory have all the time in the world, um, unless there's some other medical complication happening. So have a conversation with your provider. Um, somebody telling you, you should never deliver naturally just because the baby didn't fit or because you had a, had a rough go the first time around, I would ask some questions about that, especially if your goal is to have a vaginal birth. Um, definitely worth a conversation with your provider. Oh, this is good. Okay. This also comes from my back labor video. This is Rachel Arnold says, I delivered my daughter with her hand on her face. Is this common? Would it contribute to the tearing that I experienced? Is there a formal name for this type of presentation? So there is, this is called a compound presentation. When we talk about presentation of your baby, it's how your baby comes in the, in the pelvis. We'd say vertex, meaning head down. That's a terminology for you. Somebody asked about common terms. I'm like, I feel like that's probably a good reel. So if you don't follow me on Instagram, make sure you follow me on Instagram. Cause we have like lists of reels coming. I, most recently have an assistant. So I like actually have help with all this stuff now, guys. So there's so many fun things coming to you. So make sure you go over to Instagram and make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. So this would be hand on the face, compound presentation. It could be here, could be here, could be here, 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 wherever. But if you imagine baby coming down in your pelvis, of course, it's gonna make the surface area so much wider than the baby's head and make, it's, it's almost like you have like the size of the baby's head and you just added like another, centimeter or two to the diameter of the head. So yes, it can contribute to more tearing. It's almost like baby's like, hey mom, welcome to the world. Let me just oh, make you do some extra work for recovery on its way out. So yes, it's called, it's called compound presentation and whether or not it's common, I would say it's not uncommon. I don't have a number for you, um, but it can complicate delivery. It could lead to baby not coming down or you needing a C-section. So I'm glad that it worked out for you, but I've seen a lot where like, you don't even know. And then baby like comes out and you're like, Oh, look, little fingers. Oh, hi babe. <laughs> and then they, once they come out, their little arm comes out and then whoop, slide on out and you're good to go. Oh my God, this small pelvis thing is such a thing. Sima Ben Nifla. This is on positions to turn a posterior baby. So I show you positions to actually try. She says she's wondering if having a small pelvis is a thing. My mother was told her pelvis was too small to deliver vaginally. So she wanted to only have C-sections on her laboring days. The only way to know is by trying. That's my script. Of course, talk to your provider. That is not a, like any kind of concrete anything. There are certain circumstances where a C-section maybe would be recommended but not for a small pelvis. You don't know unless you try. Or if you do pelvimetry, I suppose if you've had like a history of a pelvic fracture and you have imaging of your pelvis or something, um, maybe you could know that, but otherwise, the only way to know is by trying. Oh, this is good. Okay, this also comes from the Kardashian style birth video. Brittany Hutchinson says, what if you and the care team don't know who you will deliver with? This is super common. They want us to attempt to see all midwives and doctors at appointments because they never know who we'll deliver with. So if that's the case, how or who do you inform of all of your preferences if who you deliver with is so unknown? This is such a good question. Okay, so in general, many of you may see a group of doctors, group of midwives, maybe a combo of the two, and you may see kind of the same person, but then it sort of depends on when you go into labor and who's on call for who delivers you. My answer to this isn't gonna be like super duper concrete, but in general, what I tell my clients is that you get to know as many as you can. You sort of, you'll get a feel and almost like if you know your preferences, bring them to every single appointment with different people and be like, hey, I know so-and-so, they reviewed my preferences, but I'd love for you to take a look, see if there's anything you're like really concerned about or that you would be really opposed to or have a preference for. 
and do their your preferences and you can do what you want, but obviously like you're working together. So you'd sort of get a feel. The other thing is if you have a primary person that you're seeing, they're gonna know the people that they work with. And so when you're going through your preferences, take it to your primary person and say, you know, doc or midwife, like these are my preferences. Talk to me about the rest of your group. What are the ranges of expectations that I can set for what to expect when I'm in labor, right? Is this gonna be common? Is this something I'm gonna have to advocate for or is delayed cord clamping something that everybody does? And they're likely gonna be able to answer that for you and give you a general overview of what, what kind of the group does. The other thing is when you're in labor, bring your preferences and then talk to your nurse. And you can sort of anticipate most providers are on for 24 hours. So if it's early in their shift, late in their shift, just ask the nurse and be like, hey, look at, will you look at my preferences? You know these providers pretty well, likely, hopefully. And how aligned are we? How do we strategize for me to, you know, be heard, be understood, and for everybody to kind of be on the same page with what my preferences are for delivery? And do you think there's anything I, I'm, that we may need to navigate together? in conversation with the provider that's on call now. So I hope that helps. Honestly, I feel like if you do that, that's gonna be a pretty solid, you're gonna get an idea going in so you have some general expectations, you know that your provider has kind of also given you those expectations, and then based on who's on, you can use your nurse as your advocate. Okay, so I'm gonna go over to Instagram. Your questions on Instagram this time around were like particularly good. They're always good, but I was just like, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> and actually I had my assistant add them to a list of questions for and ideas for future YouTube videos. So if you don't see it now, just stay tuned, make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss it. And then I may turn in, may turn it into like an entire YouTube video, depending on the topic. Sarah Morgan 16 says, my midwife finally tested me for bacterial vaginosis at 32 weeks and I'm pretty sure I've had it since 14 weeks as symptoms started then. And and it came back positive. I've had bad Braxton Hicks and discharge the entire time. Should I be worried about the fact that it went untreated for so long? I'm worried about preterm labor as Braxton Hicks have been very frequent and much stronger recently. Also, I just started your coping with labor class and loving it. I'm so excited that you're loving it. That is my favorite class as well. So Sarah, what I would say is, first of all, let's talk about bacterial vaginosis. It's just basically you have an upset in your flora, your good bacteria in your vagina. And so it ends up with the flora because they're upset, you end up with a an infection, basically. It's not an STI, it's not a sexually transmitted infection. Um, it just, it can cause like a really strange discharge, like white, yellowish discharge that usually has a, a like pretty foul odor. And so, um, yes, it can in pregnancy lead to low birth weight or preterm birth, but here's the deal. It is normal to have Braxton Hicks through your pregnancy. My suggestion to you would be for any of you guys that have any kind of foul odor down there or different discharge, now different discharge in general for pregnancy, like you're gonna have changes down there thanks to your hormones. But if you're like, oh, this doesn't smell so hot, like I, you, we need to get that checked out, then you need to get that checked out, okay? And then they treat it, they give you meds, like it's like it's such, such an easy treatment. And then it's taken care of, right? As far as your concern for it going untreated, if you're not in preterm labor right now and it's treated and better, the chance of you going into preterm labor in the future is not that high, okay? This is why I would bring this to your provider, say I'm concerned about this and that, but Braxton Hicks are contractions that are doing nothing to your cervix. You can have them for months, potentially, you can have them really strong for a while, but as long as they're not changing your cervix, you're not in labor and you're not in preterm labor, okay? So deep breath, no stress, talk to your provider about it. They may choose to check you because you've had so many contractions, and Braxton Hicks, they are technically contractions, so if they check you and your cervix is closed or they, you know, they do a, even a transvaginal ultrasound to look at the cervical length, depending on your 32 weeks, they might do that. Um, great. And then, you know, and then you can go, okay, well, I'm not in labor and now I'm just practicing really good for when labor actually starts. Liz Protzman says, if I have an L&D nurse that's refusing care to help cope in labor again, what should I do? So I'm assuming you had a rough go with your nurse the first time around. I'm so sorry. This is why bundle birth nurses exists. Um, so what I would say is if you felt like you didn't get the care from your nurse that you needed, that's one thing. And then I'm going to address the coping with labor piece. Okay. So 
I have very low tolerance for poor nursing care. I think that we are there, we meaning myself, I am a nurse and I train nurses, is that we are there to give you our best while we're there. Understanding that this is a very important day, if not the most important day of your life, and we're there to keep you safe and help you have a positive birth experience, right? So, um, and part of having a positive birth experience is helping you cope. Now, here's the deal. There's the accountability to the nurse to being the best nurse that she can be or he can be to be able to step in and give you some tools to cope. That is within a nurse's scope. That is an expectation that we should know. Mind you, I will say that nurses aren't necessarily taught in how to help you cope in labor. So they may not always be the best resource to you. And mind you, we're trying to change that and that's a part of our mentorship program, but it's just that's not a part of the culture all the time. And so understanding that, there's also the responsibility of the patient to be prepared to cope with labor on your own. And then honestly, I wish that the way the system was set up in the United States could create an environment where your nurses are there for you continuously through your whole labor. They only have one patient, which is not the case, and that there wasn't like 5,000 other things that they're being talked to about to do all the time. So is it realistic that your nurse could help you cope with labor all the time? I'm not saying that's not, that's what you're asking. I'm just kind of going with this question. Um, no, it's not. Okay. They can't probably be there the entire time. And if you want that kind of continuous support, that is what a doula is for. And so if you feel like you, you were failed loosely, or it didn't work out for you last time, I would highly encourage you to hire a doula, get some extra labor support and, or let's say it doesn't work or there's COVID restrictions or something. First of all, there is virtual doula services, which I've been doing for the last year. And then also to prepare whoever's gonna be in the room to be able to be that support person for you with the tools to help you cope while you have the tools to cope. And that's why taking a class like my coping with labor class is gonna be to me an essential prep for anybody having a baby, whether you intend to have an epidural or not, it's like you kind of have to walk in with the tools to be able to cope and then your nurse comes in and they're able to help support you with those tools and give suggestions and maybe step in at times and help ground you and encourage you and keep you safe. That would be the expectation, right? But if you want that continuous person that's sort of the expert at helping people cope, that's gonna be a doula. And then for you, holding, holding yourself accountable to do the education. And then also, mind you, if this nurse is just really throwing off the vibe, you are not meshing at all, and she's or he is just kind of getting in the way of your coping and being completely not helpful, um, it is within your rights to ask for a new nurse. And what you would do is you'd call the charge nurse or you'd ask for the charge nurse and just say, hey, we're not vibing and explain what the issue is, okay? Because that hopefully that charge nurse is gonna go give that feedback to the nurse. They can take it as a teachable moment and say, I'm looking for this type of nurse. Is that an option? Is that available? And obviously it's gonna be based on constraints on the floor. Is there availability of other nurses? Is any nurse trained in help you, helping you cope? who knows? And so if she can, then, then that charge nurse likely would switch you out for a new nurse. Okay. That's well within your right. Again, no tolerance for poor nursing care, but we have to know what we're dealing with as far as like a system and like what nurses are trained in, and then also do our part to be prepared for it. Jen Noajmo, sorry, I just butchered that. I'm sure probably Jen, um, says restoring your pelvic floor after birth. Everything feels a little weird and weaker down there. Okay. No problem, that's sort of expected you to just push like a big thing through like a very small hole in your pelvic floor muscles. This is where a thousand percent is go see a pelvic floor therapist. If you've watched any of my stuff, I'm going to reiterate once again, pelvic floor therapy should be a part of your team. Get a referral in pregnancy from your doctor, see them at least once before birth, and then plan on seeing them between the six and the eight week mark based on what their recommendation is, no matter what. And honestly, even if you had a cesarean, I still suggest going and seeing them because the, wor the worst thing is to pee yourself, have pain during sex, or be self-conscious about something else that's going on down there, okay? You should not be incontinent. Now, in the first year of year of after pregnancy, there is a little bit like your muscles are restoring and they're healing and they may be a little weaker depending on a tear. So flex and flow on that one. But if you're like years out from childbirth and you're still peeing yourself, that is abnormal. And a pelvic floor therapist or pelvic floor physio, depending on where you're at, um, they can help you with that. Okay, let's live our best life.
Amanda Schultz says, I don't want an epidural. What if I need an emergency C-section? If you haven't seen my video on types of C-section, that one is super insightful when talking and classifying different types of C-sections. And I talk about emergencies in there. Um, she says, does it get delayed? So if she doesn't want an epidural, does the C-section get delayed because she needs an epidural? We'll imply here with her question. Such a good question. So the answer to that is actually, if you don't have an epidural in labor, and you need an emergency C-section, we really want your baby out within about 12 minutes. Um, eight to 12, even less sometimes. The fastest one I've ever done is six minutes. And um, they would use general anesthesia, so they would intubate you and give you anesthesia medicine into your IV to make you go to sleep during the labor, not the labor, <laughs> during the C-section, um, so that they can get this baby out as quickly as possible. Marianne Davis Seek says, when is the time to start taking your classes? I'm 21 weeks now. Okay, so as far as spacing out my classes, I, I will say that people will ask me also all the time, I think I saw it in here, but I'm not gonna scroll to find it, is that should I take a class if I'm watching all your YouTube videos? And my answer is, a thousand percent. So what's in my class, especially my childbirth class, there's a little bit of overlap because you'll hear like the more you get to know me, the more you'll start to hear some themes. There's some things I say and like ways I explain things. But in general, what's in the class is going to be way more thorough and way more concise and also going to talk you through everything you need to know. So childbirth class, I typically recommend around 30 to 30 ish weeks. Okay. 28 to 32. And then my coping with labor class, I would do a around the 32 to 34. Um, now VBAC, I would do, honestly, if you are intending on a VBAC, my recommendation would be buy the VBAC class and do it before you get pregnant so you can set yourself up for the VBAC and then redo the class around that like 34-ish week, eh, 30 to 34 weeks. Um, and then infant safety and CPR, you can do whenever. You could do that one closer to delivery. I think I, I like the idea that it's fresh in your mind, that you're thinking about your baby like later in your pregnancy versus before, because there are some people that are like, I need to know all the things. I'm gonna sit here a big hot mess of nerves and concerns and questions for like all of my pregnancy. So if I'm working with like, like a VIP client of mine or a birth coaching client of mine, we typically start childbirth and they hire me early, early. We'll start the childbirth portion around 24-ish weeks. Um, and that it seems kind of crazy because you're halfway through your pregnancy, but at the same time, you you want it to be fresh enough in your mind that you're not like, huh, that was like six months ago that I learned that stuff. Now, mind you, with my classes, they're lifetime access, so you can do them more than once. But if you're looking to do it on a schedule where like it works out for you and it's more fresh in your mind, that's normally what I would suggest. Hannah85 says, weird one, love me a weird question. She says, if you had sex just hours before delivery, can the sperm live through the delivery? The answer is very likely yes. Um, I may have been aware of checking a patient and knowing that maybe they had had sex in the past recently. <laughs> ah, this is good. Jessica Nicole Art says, what's the deal with pregnancy seatbelt adjusters? <laughs> so good. Okay, so anything added to your seatbelt is contraindicated for pregnancy, okay? All seatbelt safety companies, and I actually have a friend who's like a seatbelt and car seat expert person, and I do have an Instagram post. If you look on my Instagram for a girl with like a seatbelt on, I talk all about seatbelt safety in pregnancy. Um, but you don't need an adjuster. Now, mind you, if your seatbelt doesn't fit around you, like it literally isn't long enough, then that would be like an extender, but the ones that go between your legs or even like knowing where to wear them, it's across the bottom and over your shoulder, through your boobs, not above, not behind your back, okay? We want you to be really safe. And adding anything to your seatbelt is unsafe, okay? Your seatbelt is enough wear it and be safe that way rather than adding something that could potentially be harmful to you. Katie Shira five says burping newborns. How long also just one burp? What if they don't burp? Okay. So here's my rule of thumb for burping and you sort of have to learn your newborn and see like, are they a big burper? Are they a barely burper? Are they like a loud burper, quiet burper? Like what's their burping habits? And so in general, you breastfeed or you feed a bottle and then sit up, give it a, give it a good little tap, tap, give them a second, lean them back, bring them forward, arch their back. See if something comes up. A lot of times you just like sit them up and they're like, Bloop. 
then you're done, okay? One burp is great, all right? Now, if you notice that your baby is gassy or upset or they're like arching their back and they are having some like, indigestion or they're having like issues with gas, then you may wanna just sit them up, let it kind of settle. And then this is where like, if you're bottle feeding, like doing a slow paste feed, um, it's gonna be better for that to help with all of that. But anyway, that's like a whole side note. One burp, then go to next boob, give them the, give them the rest of the bottle. Another one, if you don't get a burp, it's okay. Especially with breastfeeding, sometimes you may not get a burp at first, okay? But I would say uh, in general, expect it. If you don't get one, just kind of note it in your head and then be like, loo do 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 especially if they end up fussy a little later, go like, eh, I don't think they burped. Or I don't remember them burping. Then just sit them upright and bounce them up and little tap, tap, rub, rub on the back. And sure enough, you'll probably get a burp out of them later. But please don't waste your entire life trying to get a burp out of them. If you spend more than three minutes burping them and they don't burp, just give it a rest for a second. And then, you know, 15 minutes later, if you think of it, then Try again, give them a little burp, burp, throw them over your shoulder. But if they, if nothing comes out, then nothing comes out, especially if they're not fussy. Don't stress about it, but in general, yes, burp every single time. Uh, of course, I'm gonna answer this one too. Serena Redman, oh boy, it's Serena. I think it probably is if I read it. Uh, Serena Redman, I'm assuming, says, how do we become your clients if not in your area? I offer all sorts of virtual services. I even just do one-off calls with people, helping them talk through their preferences, answering questions that they have specific to their pregnancy, or I do offer virtual support and I am available by phone or text throughout their labor. Sometimes I even sit with people on labor, talk them through contractions, hoo-ha. Um, if you are interested, just hit up the email listed down below and we'll see if I have availability. Oh, this is good too. Goodness, I love your questions. Okay, Ms. Rams says, when do they actually turn off the epidural medicine? So good, you have great questions. So I would say it depends on the provider, it depends on what's happening in your labor, but in general, basic rule of thumb is you deliver your baby and then your nurse, or I guess anesthesia, but it's typically your nurse, is gonna hit off on that and let the epidural wear off. Sometimes your provider, it's usually the provider, may ask to go down on the epidural pump, so lower the dosage, or go off while you're pushing. If you're having an issue pushing, if you have no sensation whatsoever. Ideally with an epidural, we want like a little itty bitty bit of sensation where you have like pressure and you're like, ooh, I feel down there, like I wanna like, ooh, into that. We want that much. If you don't have any sensation down there, you can still push your baby out. This is like not the end of the world. It does help obviously to have, and so that's why some providers may, may suggest that, but it should be a suggestion and it should be your decision because an epidural typically wears off within about an hour to two hours, and if you're pushing for two hours, you will feel it all at the end. And so we really don't want you going from like, oh, I'm so nice and lovely with my epidural, to like, ah! and having this hugely traumatic experience because the epidural wore off or it was turned off prematurely, okay? So that's a great question for your, for your provider. When do you normally suggest turning off the epidural? And if they're like, oh, well, whenever they do it, it's probably after birth. I love the personal questions. I'm not gonna lie, every so often I'm like, Oh, so much birth. Like I kind of get birthed out a little bit. So it's always fun to throw in like a personal question. This is still a birthy sort of related question, but Jersey doula says, how did you and Justine meet? So if you don't know, Justine is the executive director of Bundle Birth Nurses. So we have Bundle Birth for patients, you guys. And then we have Bundle Birth Nurses for labor and delivery nurses, where we are training and mentoring and supporting and educating nurses all over the country and world, which is so fun and such an honor and has just been like the joy of our existence. So Justine is a labor and delivery nurse out in Riverside, California. So about an hour from me, I'm in LA. And um, she stalked me on Instagram. <laughs> she had found me and my YouTube channel and just was like, oh, I like this girl. And like, I swear, I want to connect a bunch of birth influencers. And we got on the phone one day and I invited her to my house and was like, you should come out and stay. And she came out for like two days and we just dreamed about all the things we could do to help change obstetrics, really believing in nurses as the change makers and those who are really gonna be able to make a, the most difference in your life. Obviously, the whole team makes a difference, but nurses are there for like 12 hours at the bedside with you like slaving and, and crying and working so hard for you. And so we, um, it was, it, the rest is history. We started dreaming up ideas and long story short, she officially joined the team in October of 2020. 
2020 and now um, kind of head, spearheads the mentorship portion of Bundle Birth Nurses. Emily Medal says, or Medal, not sure how to say her last name. Um, she says, what can I do to try and ensure that my milk is ready for baby when I deliver? Drink lots of water, have a healthy diet, stay active, and trust your body. So this is where like, honestly, there's nothing you really need to be doing other than just letting go and enjoying the pregnancy and then bonding with your baby. And then obviously nutrition is a big one because that's your nutrition leads to your baby's nutrition. But you have milk since week about 18-ish of your pregnancy. It's called colostrum. It is milk. It's sitting in there. We do not expect to see any of it until the placenta delivers. And so if you don't see anything, please don't stress about it. And then trust your body, have your right care team and like your support for afterwards. Um, and then supply and demand and watch all my breastfeeding videos. More of those to come. I have like a bunch of the queue that are coming soon. I think I'm going to end with this one because again, I always get so long winded, but I love this series so much and I love connecting with you guys. So if you have any other questions, please put them in the comment box down below. We will add them to the list for next month. I will be back next month, whether it will be live or pre-recorded, answering all of your questions here and make sure you subscribe down below. Follow me on Instagram. If you're a nurse or you know a labor and delivery nurse, send them over to the Bundle Birth Nurses Instagram because there's so much amazing stuff happening over there that we're so excited about. But my last question is, this is from Am Payne 12 She says, how do you know what position to try and when in labor? Okay, and I love this. She says, please, please make a printout so I can bring it to labor and delivery. Okay, so here's the deal. Is there strategy to positions in labor? Totally. Yes, this is like my bread and butter. I love this stuff. I have a whole position guide that I give my clients that I'm working on getting copywritten so I can sell it to you guys on my website. Um, it is already made actually, and I, we, I teach this in the nursing training, okay? But what I wanna leave you with here is, how do you know what position to try? And I hear this with my clients, is it's entirely what your body tells you to do. And I know that sounds kind of elusive. And I know that kind of sounds like, oh my God, like I'm not gonna, oh, I feel pressure, I feel pain, <laughs> right? But if you actually, especially now, if you're pregnant, if you start to pay attention, even now I'm like, my left butt cheek is entirely asleep. <laughs> and if I pay attention to that, I'm like, okay, my butt cheek's entirely asleep. So I need to adjust myself and just like, make a different movement because I'm uncomfortable. That's me paying attention to my instinct. So especially in early labor, really forcing yourself to pause and think like, okay, what do I feel? What would help? That's how you know. I labor with people and I am like, I, this is what I do like for a living. I mean, I make like my bread, like I say bread and butter, but literally like nurses call me from units to be like, we have this patient. We can't get this baby out. It's in a weird position. What do we do? And then I, 45 minutes later, they're texting me like it worked and they had a vaginal birth. So like, hear me out. I have suggestions for positions, but when I'm in labor with someone, the best thing you can do is tap into your instinct. And then if you were to, let's say we were laboring together and you're like, it feels better to do that. Do, <laughs> I'm talking too fast. I'm so excited. <laughs> if you're like, it feels better to do this. I am always going to tell you to do that. No matter if I have like the most crazy, fun, cool, whatever position in the world, I'm always going to tell you to do what feels better for you. It's that combination of coping, but also your body is giving you cues to where the baby needs to go. If it feels bad, don't do it. Now, at some point, ideally we're getting to a place where like nothing feels great, but if you can find something that takes you from like ah, freaking out to like, ah, okay, I'm like more tolerating this a little bit more now, that's where you need to be. Now, if you have an epidural, the goal is movement in general. And this is where like this stuff gets real complicated. Um, but if you are changing positions every 30 to 45 minutes, not spending a ton of time on your back. You can be on your back for little bits of time if we're like, you know, or sitting up or something, but that you're not just, eh, I'm like this the whole labor. Like, first of all, no one lays like that all day anyway, but then shifting your weight, opening your legs, using the peanut ball, the pillows, the stirrup, whatever, that's gonna be basic rule of thumb. Just general position changes are gonna help this baby navigate through your pelvis, get this baby down and out, and set you up for that vaginal birth.
Thanks everyone for being with me here today. If you want more from me, obviously you can head on over to my website. I will link everything down below, including the description of everything we talked about today. And then any other links that I have, make sure you follow me on Instagram, subscribe, like, comment, share. I love you all so much. Thank you so much for being with me. And then until next time, don't forget to flex and flow and I will see you soon. Bye. We doing the thing. Oh, we're recording. Shoot. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. I totally forgot. I didn't tell them what we were doing. I need wine, wine, wine. Does anyone else have this problem? Sensations are trusting in your body always. <sighs> Flex and flow. Shoot. My thing was on silent. Horn guy, you gotta cut it out, dude. I hate him. <laughs>